when the newspapers and the magazines and the books talk about you and little girls, is there anything in it? Well, I, I like young women, let's put it this way. I think most of men do, actually. What? It wasn't night, it was an afternoon. No. It was, uh, uh, I was about to make a series of photographs of uh, young girls of uh, that age for French magazine called, called Vogue Homme. I found it quite an interesting um, enterprise because I like uh, the girls of this age and uh, because the girls of that age for some reason like me and just it went a little bit too far one of those uh, on, on, on the session with this girl granted that you have this interest in, in young girls and are never concealed really that you have an interest in young girls wasn't an incident like the one that happened more or less bound to happen eventually looking back at it it probably uh, was bound to happen yes i have to point out that the girl <clears throat> has had um, testified before the grand jury to uh, previous experiences but there is a fact that there were other men in her life and uh, that nobody else had the same problems that I had. Most of people in the state of California are guilty of the similar crime since the age of consent in that state is 18. Yeah. And it's very difficult to find someone who did not have experience uh, uh, before reaching this age. Well, with me, it was a bit more extreme, of course, because the girl was uh, two weeks short of 14. And you actually did know? You actually didn't yeah, know I, knew, I, knew, I knew she was 14 because she was talking about her birthday before that. Doesn't the age of consent mean precisely that, that under a certain age, whatever age it may be, it doesn't matter if the girl says yes or not, or wants to or not, that you're supposed not to because it's... Yes, a... I know. If you, if you think of the United States, there's the stage when the age of consent is 12 mm. in the United States. Mm. But it varies from country to, uh, country to country. Yes, indeed. You know, that's, uh, well, it's very easy to say it now when you should have thought about it. Before, but if you find yourself with a girl in a certain situation, you don't exactly think of it. Age is, age is everything. You mean children or you mean age, young girls? Age is everything. So because the law is about age, not about maturity or wisdom or future stardom. I'm talking yeah, about... but in France it's 15. Okay, so, so it's in France that your, Nastasia Kinski becomes your next star, right? She's 15 years old, and the world, one way or another, finds out you're having an affair with her. In if, Germany. If the case comes to trial in California, all these things are going to... No, it can't get 50 years. I mean, this is, n this is the nonsense that press writes about. What, 50 years? N uh, that year, there were 20 or 19 cases in California itself of similar, uh, of similar nature. Nobody went to prison. Or only I th uh, there were policemen and, and uh, uh, people in public service involved in cases. Why do women like you? They don't really like me so much. Let's not exaggerate, well, you know. They like me enough for me to get in tr into trouble. Does it flatter you that women, that women like you? Of course. But why do you need to be flattered so it much? It tickles my I... ego. I just, that's why I am where I am, but because I have this tremendous ego, you know. Yeah. To, maybe it has to do with my size, you know. It's, it's well, five, six, you see. Hey, friend. Welcome to my channel, Crane and where we deep dive and break down the most iconic stars in history. If you're not yet subscribed, please be sure to do so and turn on your notifications so you never miss an upload. Now, let's get into this video. Today, we are talking about Roman Polanski. We are going to do a deep dive into his life and how he came to be. He had a very traumatic childhood we are going to talk about all of those things and as well as go deeper into some of the controversies that surrounded his life if you haven't seen my sharon tate video which i did last week and i promised i would do the roman polanski check that out because i'll go more in depth into their relationship which was a lot in the parties that they used to have that was very odd <laughs> so check out that video i'll put it in the end cards as well as it pinned in the comment section so without further ado let's get into this video so roman polanski is a renowned filmmaker who's worked has left a lasting impact on the film industry. However, his public image has been shrouded with controversy over the years, leading to mixed opinions about his career and personal life. Throughout his career, Polanski has won numerous awards, including four BAFTAs, a Palm d'Or, and an Academy Award. He has also been recognized for his contributions to the film industry with a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Zurich Film Festival. Polanski's global impact is undeniable, as his films have grossed over two billion worldwide. He has been a crucial figure in the film industry for decades, influencing and inspiring countless filmmakers around the world. However, his reputation has been tarnished by his past criminal charges. In 1977, Polanski was arrested and charged with taking advantage of a 13-year-old girl. He fled the United States before his sentencing and has been living in Europe ever since. And despite being a fugitive from justice, Polanski continues to work in the film industry. While some continue to support him, others condemn his actions and believe he should be held accountable for his crime. The debate surrounding Polanski's legacy and morality is ongoing and complex, highlighting larger societal issues about art, ethics, and justice. Now let's get into his childhood. Roman Polanski was born Rajmud Roman Thierry Polanski on August 18, 
1933 in Paris, France to Polish parents. His father was a painter and a graphic designer. His mother he was a Catholic of half Jewish descent. In 1936, his family moved back to Poland where Roman spent most of his childhood. At the age of six, Polanski and his family were forced to flee Poland after the invasion of the Nazis. They spent three long years in the Krakow ghetto where they endured starvation, disease, and the constant threat of extermination. Polanski witnessed unimaginable horrors during this period, including the death of his mother in a concentration camp. His mother, who was four months pregnant at the time, was taken to Auschwitz and they unalived her in the gas chamber soon after arriving. He watched as his father was taken away. He remembers from age six one of his first experiences of the terrors to follow, saying, and I quote, I had just been visiting my grandmother when I received a foretaste of things to come. At first, I didn't know what was happening. I simply saw people scattering in all directions. Then I realized why the streets had emptied so quickly. Some women were being herded along by German soldiers. Instead of running away like the rest, I felt compelled to watch. One older woman at the rear of the column couldn't keep up. A German officer kept prodding her back into line, but she fell down on all fours. Suddenly, a pistol appeared in the officer's hands. There was a loud bang and blood came welling out of her back. I ran straight into the nearest building, squeezed into a smelly recess beneath some wooden stairs and didn't come out for hours. I developed a strange habit, clenching my fist so hard that my palms became permanently calloused. I also woke up one morning to find that I had wet my bed." End quote. Polanski, who was then hiding from the Germans, saw his father being marched off with a long line of people. Polanski tried getting closer to his father to ask him what was happening and got within a few yards. His father saw him, but afraid, afraid his son might be spotted by the German soldiers, whispered in Polish, get lost. Polanski escaped the Krakow ghetto in 1943 and survived with the help of some Polish Roman Catholics, including a woman who had promised Polanski's father that she would shelter the boy. Polanski attended church, learned to recite Catholic prayers by heart, and behaved outwardly as a Roman Catholic, although he was never baptized. His efforts to blend into a Catholic household failed miserably. Maybe this is why he stated that he was an atheist in his later life and that he no longer believes in God. In 1945, Roman was reunited with his father but his father later died of cancer, leaving Roman an orphan at the age of 14. Polanski was forced to take part in cruel, crazy games in which German soldiers took shots at him for target practice. And while he wandered the Polish countryside seeking to stay alive after the German invasion, author Ian Freer comes to the conclusion that Polanski's tangible atmosphere he conjures up on film are influenced by his childhood fears and anxieties about violent situations. Despite the tragedy and hardships of his childhood, Roman showed remarkable resilience and creativity. He was a gifted artist and a keen photographer. He also had a passion for cinema, watching films at the local cinema every chance he got. As a child, Roman was described by his family as being quiet and introspective, but also mischievous and playful. He was fascinated by magic and illusions and would often perform tricks for his friends and family. Polanski's childhood was also characterized by a rebellious streak that often got him into trouble. He was expelled from several schools and was known to be a prankster, always looking for ways to push boundaries. Polanski was also a talented and creative child. He loved drawing, sculpting, and painting and showed a keen interest in the performing arts. One unknown fact about Roman Polanski's childhood is that he was involved in a serious accident when he was just six years old. He fell off a balcony and suffered a severe head injury that required surgery. The accident left him with permanent scar on his forehead, which he continued to conceal throughout his life. In an interview with The Guardian, Polanski's sister Annette revealed that despite the trauma of their childhood, her brother remained resilient and optimistic. He was the strongest among us. He never lost his sense of humor, and he always believed that things would get better, she said. As a teenager, Polanski studied acting and directing at the Polish State Film School in Lodz. After the war, he watched films either at school or at local cinemas, using whatever pocket money he had. As he explains, movies were becoming an absolute obsession with me. I was enthralled by everything connected with the cinema, not just the movies themselves, but the aura that surrounded them. I loved the luminous rectangle of the screen, the sight of the beam slicing through the darkness from the projection booth, the miraculous synchronization of sound and vision, even the dusty smell of the tip-up seats. More than anything else though, I was fascinated by the actual mechanics of the process. 
Now let's get into his career. He had a rough childhood that was marked by the Holocaust. This experience is reflected in his films, which often contain brutal, intense themes. Polanski's start in the film industry was not an easy one. He did not study filmmaking in school or attend a prestigious film school like many other filmmakers. Instead, he learned the art of filmmaking through trial and error. As well as working as an assistant director on a number of films, his first feature film, Knife in the Water, was made in 1962 and it was an instant hit. The film was polished and highly stylized, showcasing Polanski's unique style and vision. Polanski's style of film is characterized by psychological thrillers with an emphasis on personal demons, fears, and dread. Polanski's films are known for their dark themes and psychologically complex characters. He often explores the darker aspects of human nature and delves deep into the psyche of his characters. His films are filled with tension and suspense, which keeps the audience on the edge of their seats. His unique style of filmmaking has earned him a great deal of praise over the years, with many of his peers hailing him as a true master of the craft. His directing style is distinct, combining close-up, quick cuts, and unconventional camera angles to create tension and suspense in his films. He is one of the rare directors who masterfully balances dark humor with tragic stories. One of Polanski's most famous films is Rosemary's Baby, which was released in 1968. The film is a psychological horror based on a novel of the same name by Ira Levin. It tells the story of a pregnant woman who begins to suspect that her husband and their neighbors are involved in a satanic cult. The film was a critical and commercial success, earning Polanski his first Academy Award nomination. Another one of Polanski's most famous films is Chinatown which was released in 1974. This noir thriller stars Jack Nicholson. The film is filled with twists and turns and is widely regarded as one of the greatest films of all time. Chinatown earned Polanski another Academy Award nomination for Best Director. Over the course of his career, Polanski has won numerous awards for his work. He has won four Caesar Awards, the French equivalent of the Academy Awards, as well as the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival. He has also been nominated for the Academy Award for Best Director three times. Polanski's work has earned him the respect and admiration of his peers, and his influence can be seen in the work of many filmmakers today. Fellow director and actor Clint Eastwood has described him as a master of the craft. Roman Polanski is a legendary director with an extraordinary talent for creating suspenseful and chilling stories. His unique style of filming has set him apart and made him a beloved figure in the film industry, despite his controversial personal life. Now let's get into his relationships. Polanski's first marriage was to actress Barbara at Koska Lass, whom he met during the production of his short film when angels fall. They exchanged vows in 1959, but the marriage only lasted for two years, ending in a divorce. The reason for their separation is unclear, but many speculate that Polanski's infidelity was the main cause. A few years later, Polanski met actress Sharon Tate while filming The Fearless Vampire Killers. The two began dating and eventually tied the knot in London on January 20th, 1968. Unfortunately, their happily ever after was cut short when Tate was brutally murdered by members of the Manson family in 1969. She was eight months pregnant at the time. Many speculate that it influenced his future relationships. Like I said, I did a video for Sharon Tate already. Check that out. And if you already seen it, after watching this Roman Polanski video, you might want to see that video again to see maybe you'll have a better understanding on why some people think he might have had something to do with her murder, right? I already went in depth in the Sharon Tate's video, so I'm not going to go too deep in their marriage in this video. In 1989, he married his third wife, actress Emmanuel Siner, whom he shares two children, a daughter named Morgan and a son named Elvitz. Polanski and his children speak Polish at home, which reflects his deep connection to his Polish roots. Despite the love he has shared with his wife, Polanski's previous marriages were fraught with problems. He was a notorious womanizer and had affairs with many women. In addition, his conviction of unlawful sensual you know, relations with young girls in 1977 made him a pariah in Hollywood, and many have criticized him for his behavior towards women over the years. In 2018, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences expelled Polanski from its membership due to his conviction. However, his wife, Emmanuel Sanger, rejected the invitation to join the Academy, denouncing the hypocrisy of a group that expelled Polanski. Now let's get into his legal drama. Polanski's legal troubles date back to 1977 when he was accused of putting substances in this girl's drink and taking advantage of her when she was just 13. Samantha Geimer, the incident took place in Hollywood where Polanski had been photographing sessions with Geimer as a model. This article from Vox summed it up pretty perfectly because by his own admission, Polanski has always been drawn to girls in their younger age. He met his current wife, Emmanuel Singer, when she was 19 and he was 52. And in his book, 
autobiography he speaks boldly about you know betting 15 girls who are 15 you know in 1976 Polanski took an assignment from French Vogue that would allow him to explore his attraction to these girls he'd shoot the series of photographs that's how he met Samantha Geimer and in 1977 she was only 13 and she was an aspiring actress Polanski photographed Geimer alone without anyone there after taking a few pictures of her fully clothed he told her to take her top off and she complied and according to his own words he said she had nice tatas that's what he wrote I took pictures of her changing and topless a few months after the initial photo shoot Polanski took Geimer to Jack Nicholson's house to have a second photo shoot he this time he photographed her drinking champagne and urged her to keep getting drunk for the pictures basically after a while he instructed her to once again take off her shirt he gave her part of a quaalude he now got her into the jacuzzi and started undressing her completely he photographed her for a while and then took off his own clothes and joined her he photographed her while in the jacuzzi and this is what he said he said we weren't saying much now and i could sense a certain erotic tension between us that's what he wrote in his autobiography and she said in her own book the girl saying i didn't want to have relations but apparently that is what was going to happen yeah when he wanted to get into jacuzzi i knew i was in trouble like wait this is not what he's supposed to be doing and I didn't know what was gonna happen but I knew whatever was on his mind was not a good thing. Woman's fame at that time he was very powerful very well known. I think when you're wealthy or powerful or well known people don't say no to you and you, you have like this different view of life where you're accustomed to getting what you want um, because you get what you want. Geimer was clearly confused disoriented and on substances but she did not want it to happen so she faked an asthma attack to get out of the tub. She put on her clothes and Polanski followed her into the house. According to Polanski, this is what happened next according to him. He said, we dried ourselves in each other. She said she was feeling better. Then very gently, I began to kiss and caress her. After this has gone on for some time, I led her over to the couch. There was no doubt about her experience and lack of inhibition. She spread herself and I entered her. She was unresponsive. Grimer went on to testify that Polanski licked her vulva over her saying no several times. And then he started to cuddle with her. And then that's when he basically took advantage of her. She said she was mostly just saying no and stop it, but she wasn't really fighting him off because one, she was under substances and two, there was no one else in the house and there was no place for her to go and he was clearly overpowering her. After a while, he asked her when her last period was and whether she was on the pill. On learning that she wasn't, Geimer says, he goes, would you want me to go in through your back? And she said, no. But according to her testimony, Polanski ignored her and went on through her back door. If you catch my drift, I have to be really PG for, for YouTube guys. So please be, read between the lines. So when it was over, Geimer went out to the car and cried. Polanski drove her home and then that's when he told her not to tell her mom when he realized, okay, she did not enjoy this experience. But in his head, this was enjoyable to her. She was enjoying herself. He could not read any cues. Hmm. But later that night, Geimer told her boyfriend what had happened and her mother overheard and called the police. And the next night, Polanski was arrested. Kudos to her for quickly reacting, you know, telling. I'm glad she had a boyfriend that she could trust at the time. And I'm glad her mother was nosy. That's why sometimes you got to be nosy with your kids, okay? So when the trial started, he pleaded guilty, hoping for a plea bargain that would allow him to serve time outside of prison. The judge refused and Polanski was told he would be facing a sentence of up to 50 years in jail. After being charged with six counts, including, you know, R.A.P.E. and Sodom and Gomorrah, if you catch my drift, because I can't say that word, but the Sodom word, Polanski pleaded guilty to statutory and was ordered to undergo a psychiatric evaluation. Fearing that he would spend the majority of his life in prison, Polanski made the fateful decision to flee the United States. He boarded a flight to Paris, where he has since remained. His decision to run has been met with much backlash and scrutiny, with many calling for him to be brought back to the U.S. to face the music. Polanski evaded arrest but eventually sought exile in Europe where authorities refused to extradite him back to the U.S. This evasion drew media attention, sparking a national debate on whether artists should be held accountable for their personal lives. Polanski's escape also resulted in his exclusion from the U.S. screening of his films, including his critically acclaimed 2002 film The Pianist. Despite the international support for his release, Polanski has faced severe criticism from prominent figures within the entertainment industry and beyond. Years after the incident, Polanski was arrested in Switzerland in 2009 while traveling 
to accept an award at the Zurich Film Festival. However, Switzerland refused to extradite him to the US. And in 2014, Polanski won the Best Director Award at Cannes Film Festival, receiving a standing ovation even with the allegations still hanging over his head. A number of other women have later accused Polanski of taking advantage of them when they were younger. An Interpol red notice was issued for his arrest and he rarely leaves France. In October 2017, German actress Renette Langer told Swiss police that Polanski took advantage of her when she was 15 in 1972. The same month, the same month, American artist Marianne Bernard accused Polanski of, you know, taking advantage of her also when she was 10. In November 2019, French actress Valentine Monnier said Polanski violently took advantage of her at a ski chalet when she was young also. Despite several attempts by the U.S. legal system to bring Polanski to justice, he is seemingly beyond the reach of the American justice system. Nothing has ever been done about it. However, his past indiscretions have continued to haunt his career, limiting his recognition within the U.S. It's hard to believe that we live in a world where some people will support Roman Polanski, a man who has been a of some of the most heinous crimes imaginable. This is a man who has been accused of taking advantage of someone even as young as 10, okay? And yet there are still those who defend him, who say that he should be left alone because he's a talented filmmaker. It's disgusting how those other countries continue to harbor him as a fugitive. It's also disgusting and it's a sign of toxic culture in Hollywood that needs to change he still gets to direct movies that can be up for an Academy Award. But the problem is bigger than just Polanski. It's a systemic issue that goes beyond one man. It's a culture of silence in which powerful and wealthy men are protected from the consequences of their actions. It's a brotherhood that values loyalty over justice and that values power over morality. It's a culture that normalizes and even celebrates abuse and exploitation. In 2017, actress Emmanuel Seiner, his wife, wrote an open letter defending her husband and complained about feminist groups who were lynching him. And she's getting older. And last time I checked, he don't like people your age. So I don't know. Another actress, Charlotte Rampling, also spoke out in support of him in a 2015 interview with French radio station Europe One. And of course, these actresses will speak out for him. He makes him famous. The fact is, Hollywood has a long history of protecting people like him. For every Harvey W. or Kevin Spacey that gets exposed, there are dozens more who continue to operate in silence, protected by their connections and their powers. If it's about the entire system of privilege and inequality that exists in Hollywood, where women, people of color, and other marginalized groups are shut out of opportunities and subjected to all kinds of, you know, ills from the industry, but people like Roman Polanski <laughs> thrive, you know, but you have other directors that are marginalized that would not have the same grace. It's a system of exploitation that serves the interests of the powerful at the expense of everyone else. So when we see people supporting Roman Polanski, it's not just about one man's crimes. It's about the larger culture of corruption that allows these crimes to happen in the first place. As he stated in the intro, police officers, judges, and so on get away with these cases all the time. This was one of his arguments in court. How come they can get away with it, but I can't? We need to stop glorifying those who have a history of sensual abuse and start supporting the survivors instead. We need to make sure that no one, no matter how famous or powerful they may be, is above the law. It's time for Hollywood to clean up its act. It's getting old. It's been years. And they need to hold people accountable for their actions, not just cancel culture, but have real things in place to avoid certain things like this, okay? And to create a more just and equitable industry for everyone. The time for silence and complicity is over. We need to shine a light on the darkness because the constant glamorization of a man like this makes other directors coming up feel like they can be like that too. He got away with it. Let me follow his formula. How many people have followed his formula already and flee the country? Or, you know, if someone is, is caught up in things like that. There's swift consequences that people know I need to get my act together, that my art will not save me. I think a lot of people hide behind others' creativity and their art. Like you look at R. Kelly or Roman Polanski, they're so good at what they do that people cover them and forgive their offenses because of how good they are. And it is to me the time that we have to start saying that, hey, we can still appreciate the art. No. We can no longer appreciate the art of degenerates like this because 
if we continue to speak like that, more and more people will feel like if I'm good enough, I can get away with anything. And we have seen it time and time and time again. He's great at what he does. I can acknowledge that while still knowing I'm not gonna go pay to go see a Roman Polanski movie. And I will no longer support his artistry because I cannot fund him. The reason why he was able to flee was all that money. He was able to evade any kind of punishment was all the money from your support. If R. Kelly is able to fight his cases and still go to court this long, it's because he still has supporters out there. And that's when we hold the public accountable. Stop this glamorization. But I love you guys so much. Comment below your thoughts. Check out my Sharon Tate video and also my Brooke Shields video, which is just as crazy and wild. I love you guys so much. Until next time.